So I don't know if I, th I should thank Jeff or not for asking me to speak about this because a long time ago when he kind of assigned this to me, I thought it would be really easy to get a whole lot of video about this. And then I realized that it's really hard because most of the time we're not starting the video when these things happen. And so it was actually really difficult to get any or hardly any footage uh, on these types of injuries. And so um, I want to thank all of my Sage's friends who I polled and begged and who looked inside their computers and in the dark, uh, uh, you know, uh, dark places of their hard drives to try and find um, these little snippets for me. Um, and so a lot of this won't have video, but I, I decided at least to do a little bit of an overview about some of the things that, that can happen. Oh, is it this mouse? How did you go forward with this guy? Yep. Oh. I don't think this will impact in any way uh, what I'm going to talk about. So, um, different ways that you can access the abdomen, obviously. You can go through the umbilicus, which is the thinnest layer, um, and the fusion of all the uh, different muscles and fascia of the abdominal wall, the linea alba. You can go through the midline, at least there's not a whole lot of nerves and blood vessels there, so that can also prevent injury to those structures. I also like entering at the left costal margin. I think that's a good place, especially in patients who've had previous surgery, and there's a, there is a quite a bit of data as well to support uh, entering at the ninth intercostal space. So none of this is any surprise to anyone, I don't think. And there's a whole bunch, or, or three, I guess three main techniques that people can use to access the abdomen. Just a poll of hands, virgin abdomen, lap coli, how many people will do an open Hassan technique? Raise your hand. It's hard to tell, so many sea of people, okay? How many varus needles at the umbilicus? It's almost half and half, huh? How many people do something else than a Hassan or a varus needle for a lap coli? What else do you, what do you do? Anyone want to volunteer what you do for a lap coli? The third one, visual entry. Okay, and when you do visual entry, do you do a, a varus needle first or you just go straight with the trocar? Who goes no without pre-insufflation, open technique, OptiView? Okay. All right. So, um... Here's just an example or a short video of uh, an OptiView trocar, just in case there's some people who haven't seen it or don't know what it looks like. There's various different kinds of them available out there. And essentially the idea is to use a zero degree scope inside the trocar itself to see as you're going through the various layers. And you can see here, it becomes quite clear when, you end, when you're in the abdomen. And, and this one is clearly a, a pre-insufflated abdomen. So um, I, I decided just because I didn't have a whole lot of video to go through uh, some, uh, there's just very, very, a few key points uh, about a, a recent Cochrane review that was done on, um, on injuries related to trocar sites and varus needles. And there's basically three main points that came out of them that I thought I would share with you guys. So um, you might want to consider the use of radially expanding trocars. There does seem to be a small benefit or reduction, at least in port site bleeding related to these types of uh, trocars. That when you're using a varus needle, there doesn't seem to be any benefit to kind of pulling up on the abdominal wall. Uh, in our minds, it seems to make sense that we would want to do that and that it might bring the organs further away, but essentially you really only end up pulling the skin up and, and it doesn't really help so much. So just enter into the fascia as uh, straight on is probably a better way to do that. It, it, you don't get any additional injuries and you get less failed entries that way. And uh, the direct entry or the radially expanding uh, trocars seem to have less failed entry compared with the varus needle alone. And again, this is data that's very heterogeneous and it's difficult to make any conclusions. And as it stands, the data that we have does not suggest that there's any increase in the rate of um, bowel or vascular injuries uh, between varus needle or closed technique and open Hassan technique. 
So other things to consider when you're thinking about putting trocars in somebody's abdomen or patients who've had previous abdominal surgery. I mean, a lot of these things um, used to be contraindications to lapar laparoscopic surgery um, and no longer are, but these are all things that we need to take into consideration. Certainly in, in patients who've had previous abdominal surgery, try to avoid incisions because that's where the adhesions usually end are. Uh, and oftentimes I like entering in the left upper quadrant in those patients. Um, very obese patients, uh, some people do prefer using a varus needle, it tends to be a little bit quicker. And the uh, umbilicus is often displaced or the anatomy is distorted, so the umbilicus is often not a good place. Um, pregnancy, I would strongly advocate using an open technique. Um, and of course, if you're doing something like a bowel obstruction, there's very dilated bowel, you want to be very careful putting any blind um, trocars in there. Here is a photo of a gravid uterus with a um, trocar uh, injury, um, which I got really through some uh, hearsay from Gaetan Brochu. Um, Dennis Klassen told me about this, that he saw it and it was very disturbing. And I emailed Gaetan and he sent it to me and it looks like um, this was from an open Hassan technique. So uh, it, it can also happen and uh, pretty scary. Um, so access-related complications for um, major vascular injuries, pretty rare. Often mesenteric bleeding in the midline uh, can happen if you're accessing in the midline. You can get quite a bit of bleeding from epigastric vessels. Um, uh, if you have a big uh, a bleed that's in the retroperitoneum, you need to have uh, some index of suspicion for it, an expanding hematoma, something like that, it can happen. If you have a large venous injury, you can get air embolism. And, um, I have this video, which is in a pig, um, which we show as part of FLS, but I'm sure if you saw this, you would be very disturbed. I don't have any real footage from anyone. Um, I don't know if any of you guys out there have footage, video footage of um, major vascular injuries after uh, access, but if you do, load them onto Sage's pages, because I looked all over YouTube, all over everywhere, and I couldn't find any, so. Um, uh, here is also, um, you know, it, it, you should look out for the epigastric vessels and try not to put a trocar in there. You can always use a suture passer and over sew that if needed, um, but uh, they, they can result in pretty big hematomas or occasionally bleed into the abdomen, which can be a problem. So GI um, uh, complications happen in about 1% of procedures. Uh, if you're using a varus needle, especially in the left upper quadrant, and the, and the anesthesiologists were bagging the patient, it's probably a good idea to put an NG tube and decompress that stomach. Um, here is a video that Bruce uh, gave me, uh, which is a trocar that has a little surprise when you actually think you're going into the abdomen, going into the bowel. That would be bad. So how many people would, if this happened to them, just access the abdomen, la put another trocar, another port somewhere else in the abdomen? Okay, how many people would convert? All right. Where's Bruce? What'd you do, Bruce? <laughs> ah. <laughs> I thought so. Um, move forward. This is a video from Archana showing a 90-year-old um, patient that was scheduled for an incisional hernia repair that uh, they found a transverse colon injury after a blunt insertion of a trocar, um, which they repaired laparoscopically. How many people would repair this injury laparoscopically? How many people would delay the hernia repair for another day? How many people would repair the hernia primarily? Well, and, and this, it's hard to know because you don't really know the, the, the case, but apparently that's what they did here. There was a, a pretty small defect and they repaired it primarily with, with suture passers laparoscopically. I don't know what I'm doing wrong with this thing. Got the mouse. 
Okay. Here is a tap in a patient uh, of, of Arjuna's, actually, who she told me was an alcoholic and apparently drank quite a bit. I don't know when, how long before the surgery, but had a, a very, very full bladder coming into the case. Um, and you can see here um, that there is quite a big hole in the bladder. How many people in this case would repair the uh, bladder injury through the preperitoneal space laparoscopically? Less, much less people. How many people would, so what she did in this case was actually uh, repair the bladder through the preperitoneal space and then she took the patient back about three months later or so and repaired his hernias um, using a tap technique and um, the patient did just fine. Here is a video that Dennis Klassen showed me, not necessarily related to the initial trocar placement, but really easy for things like that to happen when trocars are getting whaled, uh, flailed around, uh, so a little injury to the liver there. And another one also from, uh, from trocar insertion on the bottom there, quite a big rent in the liver that took them quite some time to get control of through compression with two instruments, some surgicel, and finally some uh, um, fibrin glue uh, sealant, yeah. So, I think that's pretty much all I got. I think I might have one more. Um, and this is a video that I got from Sage's Pages of a uh, port site hernia. Um, so, uh, you know, it is recommended that we close all port sites that are bigger than 12 millimeters. Um, so there, there, you know, not everybody will close the radially dilating ones, but in general, anything bigger than 12 should be closed to avoid these types of complications. So these complications are rare, but they can be devastating, and we should have a high index of suspicion. Um, there doesn't seem to be any clear difference between the open and closed techniques. Um, I think open is, however, favored in most patients, but not all with previous surgery. And I think you also need to be honest with yourself and do what technique you're most comfortable with. Um, any questions? I don't see any questions on, or, or comments. Anybody want to comment about the footage that they saw? Or anyone want to comment on things, how they would have managed things differently? Or their own experiences that they've had with uh, access site injuries? Um, please. Sri Varman from Australia. Now, almost everybody would have seen these uh, complications in their own lives. Th this is nothing new. This has happened before. And in fact, one of my teachers told me that to make a really original complication or mistake, you must be a genius. <laughs> well, Melina, I'll, I'll ask you a question. Uh, we've come across this before, but uh, at trocar access, uh, some people don't put a Foley in when they're doing a laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair, and you have trocar injuries to the bladder. Uh, would you put a piece of mesh in? Because urine is supposed to be sterile after you repair the bladder. Um, I wouldn't, um, but I think that there you could justify it, and I know people who have, and, and there haven't been any problems. I have all patients void before. Um, I don't routinely put in Foley's prior to laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair, and I also communicate with the anesthesiologist to try and limit the amount of volume that they give them intraoperatively. Um, personally, I wouldn't put mesh in. I don't know, we can pull the audience. Who would put mesh in with a small bladder injury, a little urine leaking? Who would not? <laughs> Who'd put biologic? <laughs> we'll ask that. Who would put biologic in? Not very many people. No. One, two. Yes, please. Um, I don't think your texting or your uh, web thing is working because I tried both ways and it didn't work. But I, my question was, um, can we check that? I don't know who checks that, but can you check it, please? Sorry, thank you for yeah, bringing that up. No problem. <laughs> um, what was the outcome of the injury to the gravid abdomen and how exactly did they get that with an open t technique? To be perfectly honest, I don't know. I think the patient did well. Dennis, if you're here and if you want to comment on that, I couldn't uh, get into contact with, with Gaetan uh, Brochu to ask him the sort of outcome of this, but my understanding is that the patient did just fine. I don't think there was any insufflation, because certainly insuff uh, uh, insufflation into gravid uterus can be deadly, so um, 
uh, I, d I don't actually know, and I apologize for that. I just never got heard back from, from Dr. Brochu. San Chong from University of Iowa. So I actually operated on a patient who is 27 weeks pregnant for appendectomy, and I went in blindly at the right upper qu quadrant with um, the virus. What I did was I like, used a CT scan, see where the uterus is, and like palpate. I guess like that's not recommended, but it did fine. And I talked to the OB guy. They were like, about two months ago, someone from an outside hospital did a similar thing, and they actually injured the uterus with the troca. So what is recommended is that you just stitch up the uterus in layers. Make sure you stitch up the um, mucosa followed by the serosa, and the baby did fine. Um, as for the bladder injury, um, I routinely repair patients with inguinal hernia who undergo robotic prostatectomy or open um, prostate um, resection with putting in mesh. So I use Pritex mesh. I've not had an infection, and there are papers out there that says that you can put mesh. So I would think that if in a routine inguinal hernia surgery, if you damage the bladder, um, one of my colleagues sent off the urine culture and urine microscopy, everything was clean, and she put in a mesh and the patient did well. Thank you. We'll limit it like two more questions. Yep, we'll do two more questions, then we'll move on. Hi. Ignatius Buddha from Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, I had the, just a comment. I had to uh, defend the virus needle versus the Hassan open technique at uh, a presentation with our medical council, lawyers present, our medical insurance companies, lots of lawyers present, more of them than we were, and there are enough uh, uh, articles out there, and I think some of them come from Australia, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to suggest that the open technique uh, has more complications with bowel, bowel injury than various technique. So if you go and look, it is there. Uh, you just have to do a proper search. Thanks. No, I think if you're looking for them, you can find articles that will point you in either direction. Um, and my personal opinion is that I don't think that the, the quality of the data is really good enough uh, for these very rare complications to decide one way or the other. Uh, but, but thank you. Yeah. Last question, please. Uh, Steve Rose, Central Atlanta. Um, I think what kind of alludes to that is if I've seen having had to help my gynecological colleagues fix bowel injury repairs from Assans, it's, I'm always wary of people that do an Assan on a prior Assan, on a prior, they always have to go at the belly button. And I think some of that avoiding the bowel injury, I'm curious what, what you all would think about having a little versatility of where you enter. They, but I see a lot of people always go back in there and they almost get a bowel injury because it's a, somebody who's had like a tubal and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I just wonder, going up in the left upper quadrant, right upper quadrant, getting away from there might avoid these issues and not sticking to just one technique every single time. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I think uh, I always try to avoid previous incisions um, and, uh, and, and versatility in that regard, I think, is, is key to do any type of redo surgery uh, at all by laparoscopy. Okay, thank you.